Britain's royal palaces. Symbols of power. Royal palaces are the bricks and mortar embodiment of what it means to be royal. And prestige. To see it is to believe it. It's a veritable feast for the eyes. Packed to the rafters with incredible secrets. From royal courtships to royal births to royal marriages and scandals, the palaces have played host to all of that. In this series, we step beyond the Golden Gates. We all want to see inside the palace walls. You feel as if you were being let into a secret world. Learn how these stunning buildings were constructed. This is a mad, eclectic vision of one man. Windsor was built to do battle. It's best not to get locked in one. You don't know when somebody's going to come and let you out. Unveil their spectacular artworks. The Royal Collection is simply stunning. The story of the tiara is like a spy mystery. We can only imagine how excited the Queen must have been. Delve into their gruesome histories. Frankly, if you're going to cut the head off a king, it's got to be done in a palace. And revisit recent events that have shaped the modern royal family. I could see that his legs were trapped. Camilla was one of the most unpopular women in the country. To see those images of the castle in flames, there was an emotional impact for the nation. This is The Secrets of the Royal Palaces. This time, we reveal the hidden palace at the very heart of the monarchy. Bless the Royal Princess Elizabeth II. It's where, when a new king or queen is proclaimed, that's where it'll happen. The unfortunate history of Dr. Lopez at the court of Elizabeth I. Two Portuguese agents confessed that actually they had been conspiring to kill the Queen and that Lopez had been part of the plot. And the Holyrood Castle skull that holds the key to unveiling the face of a legendary Scottish king. No contemporary images of him survive. And so the skull, as well as the written descriptions we've got, are really the essential clues to this man. We uncover the shocking secrets of Queen Victoria's diaries. What you get from her insights are that she was a passionate woman. She enjoyed sex. She was in love with her husband and really celebrates their intimacy in her diary entries. And at Balmoral Castle, we explore whether the Queen intervened in the crucial referendum for Scottish independence. This is a woman who does not make off-the-cuff remarks. Britain's royal palaces are amongst the most instantly recognisable buildings in the world. Millions of visitors cross the royal threshold every year. But hidden among the streets of London lies an extraordinary palace that is often overlooked. St James's Palace is really quite easy to miss. It's tucked away. It's hidden in one sense. You forget it's there. Uh, it's not very noticeable. But what few of us realize is that St. James's Palace is actually the real seat of royal power. This unassuming place is actually higher in seniority than Buckingham, even Windsor. It is the principal palace of the United Kingdom. And it is still officially the headquarters of the uh, British monarchy. And it's where, when a new king or queen is proclaimed, that's where it'll happen. To bless the royal princess Elizabeth II with long and happy years to reign over us. St. James's Palace is also the oldest working royal palace in London. It was built in 1532 by England's most prolific palace builder, Henry VIII. St. James's Palace is synonymous with the Tudors, with Henry VIII, um, who built it on the site of a former leper hospital. Might have bought it in anticipation of having children, a place just outside of London, across fields, and maybe at a safe distance from plague. Another theory is that it was simply for hunting, because Henry loved hunting and took every opportunity he could to do it. But whether as a hunting lodge or nursery, Henry wanted this new palace to make an impact. For that, he relied on the very best building materials of the age. Now, you might think of brick as a commonplace material today because it's the obvious choice for building houses by the thousand. 
but in the early 16th century, it was quite a prestigious material. Using brick was very much a statement of that wealth and power. The final impression was a vivid pink structure, something that would have stood out for a mile. This vivid pink may have faded, but much of his brick-built masterpiece remains intact today. When you go down St. James's Street off Piccadilly, what's facing you is the great gatehouse that he put there. That's really one of the lovely pieces of 16th century London that's tucked away. Behind the original gatehouse lies the Chapel Royal, begun while he was courting Anne Boleyn. And it's said that Henry added their initials, HA, to the building after the wedding. But his marriage to her lasted only three years. It took a good number of years to complete. He'd been chopping and changing his wives quite quickly before the Chapel Royal was completed. By the time it was finished in 1540, Henry was on to wife number four, Anne of Cleves. If you look up at the ceiling of the Chapel Royal, you will see Anne of Cleves' arms. Holbein was the painter who was brought in to dedicate this chapel to a queen who in the end only lasted for six months. So Henry VIII's capriciousness, his extended midlife crisis, is really well illustrated by St. James's. And this monarch we hear so much about, love him or loathe him, he left his mark and it's still, today, a working palace. The Chapel Royal is open to the public for Sunday service. And for the royals, it's still a huge part of family life. Prince George and later Prince Louis were both christened here events that brought four generations of monarchy together under one historic roof. St. James's Palace has been at the heart of the monarchy since 1532. But in 2014, another royal residence, Balmoral, suddenly found itself amid a huge political upheaval. Every summer, the Queen and Prince Philip decamp to Balmoral their private Highland getaway to enjoy some time away from official royal duties. Traditionally, the Queen receives a guest at the end of each summer, the current British Prime Minister, who travels to Balmoral for a long weekend. British Prime Ministers always go and stay at Balmoral every summer. Some have liked it more than others. John Major used to love it. Margaret Thatcher hated it. Famously, the Queen offers friendliness, not friendship. It's a chance to get a working rapport going, but it's not as if you're about to become best buddies. In 2014, it was the turn of Prime Minister David Cameron. He was far from relaxed. Scotland was days away from the referendum, which would decide the future of the Union. At breakfast with the Queen, they were in for a shock. All the newspaper headlines are laid out on a Sunday morning and there was a copy of the Sunday Times putting the yes vote ahead to independent Scotland for the first time in the whole campaign. Terrible news for him, extra terrible for it to happen over breakfast in the royal household where the Queen, who has been ruler of a United Kingdom for 62 years at that point, was suddenly perhaps being told that she might not have a United Kingdom much longer. The future of the Union itself was now at stake. It's a massive constitutional deal, and I think it is close to the uh, Queen's heart. Um, she is half Scottish, and bear in mind that people who invented the United Kingdom were her family. It was, it was James I of England, James VI of Scotland, who uh, formed uh, Great Britain and invented the flag. With the pressure on, David Cameron came up with a way to help keep the Union together. And Crathy Kirk, the small church near Balmoral, became the site of an extraordinary royal event. Coming up, while staying at Balmoral, the Queen faces the prospect of Scottish independence. If she could raise an eyebrow so much as a quarter of an inch, it might make a huge difference. She certainly would not have wanted to wake up to Scotland being a separate country. And at Kensington Palace, a disgruntled king has his wife investigated for adultery. George decided his wife smelt and he was never going to touch her again, which didn't really wash that much, but who did at the time?
Britain's magnificent royal palaces are central to the role of the monarchy. They have been the stage for era-defining moments, from Windsor weddings to Sandringham summits. And at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire, we explore whether the Queen intervened in the crucial referendum for Scottish independence. In September 2014, Scotland was days away from voting, and a new poll had put the yes vote in the lead. At this pivotal moment, David Cameron was staying with the Queen at Balmoral. The Queen cares deeply about Scotland. She would be, uh, I think, desperately sad if the United Kingdom actually split up. Despite any feelings she may have, the Queen must hold an impartial position. Her own personal views are not supposed to feature. But the threat of the breakup of the United Kingdom called for desperate measures, as David Cameron later admitted. David Cameron was very keen the Queen should intervene in some way. Didn't want to do anything she wasn't comfortable doing, but if she could, he said, raise an eyebrow so much as a quarter of an inch, it might make a huge difference. Their private secretaries decided that the Queen could perhaps say something in a very non-political way to maybe suggest what her thoughts were. Her job is to remain politically impartial and to do what her government instructs her to do. Now that is impossible, it's a catch-22. On the one hand, she has to do what he tells her, and on the other hand, he's telling her to do something that is unconstitutional and is putting her in an invidious position. David Cameron later insisted that he hadn't asked her to do anything unconstitutional. But on Sunday the 14th of September, with four days remaining until the vote, as she left the church, the Queen stopped to speak to the crowd. And as usual, the press were there. We knew the Queen would be at church. We ensured the reporter was there on the off chance. As the Queen exchanged a few words with the crowd, she made an unusual comment before leaving in her car. The local journalists uh, spoke to those uh, well wishers to, to a woman who relayed what the Queen had said to her. The Queen had said, I hope people think very carefully. And this is a woman who does not make off-the-cuff remarks. They knew it was intended to be overheard. It was a neutral phrase, I hope people think carefully, uh, but uh, I think most people realised what she was uh, saying. With this seemingly innocuous remark, the Queen walked a very fine line. I think the cleverness of that line was that it could be read every which way. And so I think it did still protect her position, but it also does give you an indication of how she really felt. She issued a statement which was unofficial, off the cuff, and entirely brilliant and well thought out. She didn't express an opinion about which sides should win, but she just said, think carefully, she urged caution, and she actually maintained her own impartiality as much as she could. Those words were then relayed from that journalist to every news desk in Scotland, and from every news desk in Scotland to every news desk in the UK. And within a few hours, this was the biggest story um, of the day. The Queen's comments came at a crucial moment. Four days later, Scotland voted to stay within the United Kingdom, much to the relief of David Cameron and, according to him, the Queen herself. David Cameron was caught on camera saying how when he rang the Queen to tell her the result, she purred down the line. Widely covered in the press, a source conveyed that the palace was displeased with David Cameron's account of this conversation, but no official statement was released. Some believe that the Queen's comment reflected the alarm the British government felt over Scottish independence. David Cameron and the entire UK establishment did drag the Queen into politics. That was the scale of the challenge. I don't think the Queen would have done it unless she had wanted to do it. She certainly would not have wanted to wake up to Scotland being a separate country. Balmoral is where the Queen spends quality time with the Duke of Edinburgh, her husband of 73 years. But not all royal husbands are as loyal as Prince Philip, as was the case with George IV and his treatment of poor Caroline 
in what was to become known as the Delicate Investigation. Kensington Palace, George IV sent his estranged wife Caroline here after the sordid affair of the Delicate Investigation. George IV was a pretty bad husband, drunk, unfaithful, pretty insulting. So it makes it particularly ironic that he decided to investigate his wife, Princess Caroline, for adultery. They disliked each other from their very first meeting, just three days before their wedding in 1795. But there was nothing to do. The marriage had to go ahead, and it went ahead at the Chapel Royal of St. James's Palace. And George was completely and utterly drunk. He was wasted. The wedding night was unsurprisingly a complete disaster. George decided his wife smelt and he was never going to touch her again. I mean, she didn't really wash that much, but who did at the time? George couldn't bear Caroline. He really expects Caroline to sit there, abandoned, doing embroidery. She doesn't want to. She wants to have fun, and she starts to make a lot of friends who come and see her. And increasingly, people are saying, hmm, maybe some of those friends aren't quite reputable, and maybe she's seeing them when she's not quite dressed. George hated Caroline so much, he decided to start the delicate investigation, a public investigation of Caroline for her conduct. A book of the proceedings was published, although suppressed, details leaked out. So the royal dirty linen was washed out for everyone to see. Literally, as well as metaphorically, there was a question about how dirty were Caroline's bedsheets. Finally, the cabinet committee acquitted Caroline of adultery, but they did say they thought she'd been indiscreet in her conduct. And the country was up in arms. It really reeked of the hypocrisy of George and the royal family. After the investigation, his attitude to Caroline hardened. He abandoned her and sent her off to live at Kensington Palace so he could have fun with his mistresses. George never stopped hating Caroline, and all throughout his reign, he was in battle with Napoleon. And when they came to him and said to him that Napoleon was dead, they said, sire, your greatest enemy is dead. And he said, oh, is she really? I.e., his greatest enemy, he thought, was his poor, abandoned, miserable queen, who he'd packed off to Kensington Palace. Only two miles away from Kensington Palace stands the grand but less imposing Clarence House. It's part of St. James's Palace, constructed nearly 500 years ago to house the heir to the throne. And it's doing the same job today, because tucked away in the southwestern corner of the palace complex lies this place, Clarence House, London home to Prince Charles. Clarence House is right next door to St. James's Palace, but because the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall Camilla have their home there, their London residence, I would say the epicentre of power really is Clarence House now, much more than St. James's. Built in 1825, the house owes its existence and name to another heir to the throne, the Duke of Clarence. William, Duke of Clarence, was the third son of George III. He never intended to become king. He wasn't the heir, he wasn't even the spare. He was the spare once removed. But when his elder brothers died without heirs, William found himself inheriting the throne. With the throne in sight, the Duke needed a house more befitting a future king. He realises, crikey, I'm actually probably going to become king. And quickly there's a sort of refurb of what was a Tudor stable yard in the grounds of St James's Palace. As usual, being part of royalty, no expenses spared. The man for the job was architect John Nash. A good friend of the current king, George IV, Nash had already designed the extraordinary Brighton Pavilion for him and converted Buckingham House into a palace. But the Duke of Clarence's taste was much less flamboyant than his brother's. Clarence House, for the new Prince of Wales, is much more modest than anything that George IV had built. It really melted away, it disappeared within a Nash streetscape of white stuccoed buildings leading all the way up to Regent's Park. Nash's Clarence House was designed to fit in with upper-class London, not to stand out. 
It suited William so well that when he finally became king, he turned down the grander Buckingham Palace and instead stayed at Clarence House. He wanted an elegant, serviceable townhouse. He didn't want to move into the showy Buckingham Palace. Instead, he wanted his own place that was smart, that was sophisticated. And the same dilemma has faced other royals since then. In the 20th century, Princess Elizabeth lived here before becoming queen. In the early years of married life, the Queen and Prince Philip decorated Clarence House just as they uh, wanted it. And then, tragically, her father died very young and Elizabeth and Philip were told they had to live in Buckingham Palace. They had to move over the road and they really didn't want to. When the Queen, however reluctantly, moved to Buckingham Palace, the Queen Mother was handed the keys to Clarence House and she made it her home for the rest of her life. I found it quite homely, actually. I remember particularly the Queen Mother's birthdays at Clarence House, and then the crowds would uh, gather outside from very, very early in the morning. And then the Queen Mother would come out and greet them all, and she really enjoyed that. So it was a place of great joy. When she died, Clarence House was passed on to the next generation, her beloved grandson, Prince Charles, and his wife, Camilla. Her death really, really affected him. He moved into Clarence House where she had lived and it's now his home in London. Prince Charles adored his granny. He spent an awful lot of time with her through his childhood and in later life. Um, he would go to Clarence House and spend time with her there. He was immensely close to her, so it's no surprise to me at all that after her death, he decided that he would keep her there ever present. But could this sentimental tie possibly lead to a shift in the seat of monarchy when the time comes. Clarence House is very dear to the Prince of Wales, but they've always made clear when asked that Buckingham Palace will continue to be, you know, the home of the monarchy. And that's something that I guess we'll only find out the answer to in due course. Coming up, at Holyrood Palace, how a 14th century skull unveiled the face of a legendary Scottish king. At first glance, this doesn't look like an extraordinary artifact. It's a simple rosewood box, and on the plinth you can see an inscription that says, Roberta Scotorum Rex. It's a plaster cast taken directly from the skull of Robert the Bruce. And at Windsor Castle, the shocking secrets of Victoria's diaries are exposed. The journals contain amazing insights into Victoria's life, into her moods, her moments of happiness and sadness, insights into her sex life. We start to feel a little bit more about what this queen was about. The royal palaces have always reflected our national history. But it's not just these magnificent buildings that the crowds turn up to see. It's the royal collection, spread across the palaces and holding everything from priceless jewels to mysterious royal artefacts that bring the past back to life. And at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh, one of the most macabre and intriguing items in the royal collection is to be found. At first glance, this doesn't look like an extraordinary artefact. It's a simple rosewood box, and on the plinth you can see an inscription that says, Roberta Scotorum Rex, Robert, King of the Scots. It's a plaster cast taken directly from the skull of Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce is one of the heroes of Scottish history. In 1328, he signed the Edinburgh-Northampton Treaty, guaranteeing Scottish independence from England for nearly 300 years. Robert the Bruce is a very, very significant historical figure, a Scottish king who beat the English and ensured the independence of Scotland for hundreds of years until the Act of Union. The cost of separation from England was 20,000 pounds, worth around 24 million pounds today. Robert died soon after and was buried in a spectacular golden marble tomb in Dunfermline Abbey. The original tomb of Robert the Bruce was destroyed, but in the 19th century, it was opened up. An artist was allowed to come in and make a perfect cast from the skull. 
The cast was put on display in Holyrood Palace, next to the ruins of Holyrood Abbey, where Robert the Bruce had signed the famous treaty. Relics and actual physical examples of past monarchs are very, very important in, in the royal collection. It's a marvellous way of telling the stories. It may seem gruesome, but that's very much in tune with royal history. It shows however grand you are, however important you are, one day you will be dead and buried, but perhaps you'll live on in some way, even if it's only in a museum. In 2016, this regal skull provided a direct link to the past. The universities of Glasgow and Liverpool John Moores stunned the world, claiming to have uncovered an incredible royal secret, what Robert the Bruce really looked like. They built up from the skull using animation, CGI, and the face that you see at the end is the closest that we can imagine from just the bones of what Robert the Bruce looked like. It's hugely important, particularly because no contemporary images of him survived. And so the skull, as well as the written descriptions we've got, are really the essential clues to this man. And now his skull is on display at Holyrood Palace, a suitable home for a king of Scotland. It is so fitting that this cast of Robert the Bruce's skull is in Holyrood, because that is the very heart of Scottish government. The skull of Robert the Bruce is one of the most prized objects in the Royal Collection, an amazing thing. The skull draws visitors inside Holyrood Palace, but at St James's Palace, it's the gardens, designed by a king, which bring in the tourists. Behind its red brick Tudor facade and high walls, St James's Palace is largely off limits to the public. But there is one part of the ancient palace open to everyone, the former palace grounds, now known as St. James's Park. St. James's Park has been a bit of a playground for monarchs since Henry VIII, be it hunting in Henry's case. London is unique in the world as a capital city with royal palaces cheek by jowl with semi-wilderness of parks. It's because Henry VIII loved murdering deer. Originally a stretch of marshland teeming with grazing deer, the park was intended as a royal hunting ground. And Elizabeth would go stag hunting there. James I, Elizabeth's successor, in fact had something of a menagerie there. He collected all kinds of animals and had them in the gardens at St James's Park. But it was the merry monarch, Charles II, who made the most dramatic change to the palace grounds. After 11 years of a republic that saw him exiled in France, in 1660, Charles was invited back to reclaim the monarchy. On his return, he wanted to make his mark on London. He'd been inspired by parkland around French estates for fun and for pleasure. And so when he returned to London, he looked to St James's Palace and the gardens as being used for something similar. He brought fashion, he brought culture, and it brought life back to England. And what he did within his palaces and the landscapes that surrounded them was contribute to that sense of well-being in a nation that had been utterly traumatized. The palace gardens, once reserved for royals, were opened up to the public for anyone to use. He opened up the park so that polite society would walk in them again. And the style in France was uh, long avenues and what are called parterre de broderie, clipped grass in sometimes geometric, sometimes flowing shapes. It's an intricate kind of gardening. So it was he who brought a bit of Paris to London and made plain piece of hunting ground in Henry VIII's period into something which appealed to the absolute highest echelons of society. It was a model landscape. Serene and peaceful by day, by night, Charles's park held some sordid secrets. By day, it was uh, the fashionable face of London, but by night, absolutely not. 
The second Earl of Rochester, I think, wrote a poem. It was called A Ramble in St James's Park. And by that time, a ramble was a euphemism for the pursuit of sexual pleasure. Seediness aside, the London Park would become a blueprint for other city parks around the world. Much of the landscape has changed over time, but there's one lasting reminder of Charles's vision, a gift given to him in 1664. He's actually gifted some pelicans from the Russian ambassador, and uh, you can enjoy looking at their, are they their real descendants? I don't know, but there are still pelicans today in St. James's Park. Back inside St. James's Palace, the Chapel Royal has seen a host of royal weddings. One marriage that got off to the worst possible start was the wedding of Prince Frederick and the sick princess. It was 1736. George II decides he wants his playboy son, Frederick Prince of Wales, to marry a proper German Protestant princess. So they decide on this poor girl, Augusta of Saxe-Coburg. She's only 16. She's not courted, she's just told she's got to go and marry him. She doesn't want to come, but she has no choice. She's packed off with her doll on this ship, and the journey is really rough. She arrives in England, she's got terrible seasickness, and also she can't speak a word. Her parents hadn't taught her English because they were convinced that everyone in England, now they've been ruled by German kings, would all speak German. Of course, not. She's bunged into this tight wedding dress, bunged onto St. James's Chapel, and when she's marched up the aisle, it's too much. She throws up, and she throws up all over her mother-in-law's very expensive skirt. Not the best start when your mother-in-law's the queen. But you know, actually, Augusta herself becomes a very good wife to Frederick. She really becomes a great support to him. So it shows that there's a possibility that the marriage can work, even if a wedding is full of disasters, even if you're sick on the floor of a palace. Another successful royal marriage was that of Victoria and Albert, totally in love till the day he died. Many artifacts housed in the royal collection offer a rare insight into the couple's lives, like those held in Windsor Castle's Round Tower. The Round Tower is the home of the Royal Archive and it holds literally thousands upon thousands of documents, letters, uh, state speeches from the kings and queens of the last 250 years. Housed in the tower are the detailed journals of Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria was a voracious writer. It's extraordinary how many words she wrote a day. Starting aged 13, the diaries run from her childhood at Kensington Palace through her entire reign up to her last years at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, where she died in 1901. The journals contain amazing insights into Victoria's life, into her moods, her moments of happiness and sadness, insights into her sex life. They completely contradict this image of the Queen as very remote and austere. You start to feel a little bit more about what this Queen was about. One of the biggest shocks they reveal is the Queen's enjoyment of her love life. What you get from her insights are that she was a passionate woman. She enjoyed sex. She was in love with her husband and really celebrates their intimacy in her diary entries. She described her wedding night with breathless enthusiasm. Well, we know that their wedding night blew her young mind. She had never, never spent such an evening. Yes, they kissed and they clasped again and again. Um, and there's this real sense of them enjoying each other's sensuality. She boasts in her diary, we didn't get much sleep. No, they were far too busy producing, not a son and heir, it was a daughter who arrived nine months later on the dot in November called Victoria. There are very frank expressions of desire throughout the journals. And it completely counteracts that idea we have of the Victorians as being so prudish that they would even cover up table legs or piano legs for fear that they were being too suggestive. Through the diaries, 
we learn of her love of Balmoral, the royal retreat designed by her beloved Albert. We know that after Albert died in 1861, she completely withdrew from public life for a decade or more. But thanks to the journals, we can now uncover all of that. They tell us a huge amount about life behind the scenes. She was too grief struck to go to his funeral, but every year she went back to her Scottish castle. And lest we forget, this was dearest Albert's own creation, own work, own building. It had the impress of his hand, she wrote. She saw him everywhere because it was his vision. She adored it. And of course, when Albert dies, you then get a, a, a cairn in the grounds. Balmoral was the embodiment of her prince. While Queen Victoria's journals give us an extraordinary insight into one of our longest reigning monarchs, they could have told us so much more. Coming up, why a royal daughter destroyed the evidence of the Queen's secret Balmoral passion. This has led to some historians calling her one of the most appalling people in history. And why a palace visitor found himself on trial for his life. An invitation to Windsor Castle under Elizabeth I might seem like a dream ticket, but you had to be careful because there were spies everywhere. The royal palaces are more open and accessible than ever before, allowing the public a glimpse through the gilded keyhole. But the opportunity to delve into the mind of a monarch is much rarer. Stored in the vaults of Windsor Castle, Queen Victoria's diaries are among the most treasured palace artefacts. In her lifetime, she probably wrote over 60 million words. 44,000 pages of the journals remain, but that represents only around a third of her writing. The rest were not lost through decay or neglect, but destroyed by Victoria's own daughter. Princess Beatrice was Victoria's youngest daughter, and for much of her later life, she was a crutch to her mother. Aged only four when her father died, Beatrice became her mother's emotional support, entrusted with editing her journals for posterity. She spent more than 30 years transcribing the journals, and it can't have been an easy task at all. Over the years, Victoria's failing eyesight affected her writing. There is a photograph of her struggling to read a letter. And her handwriting, which had been very beautiful, got bigger and messier and more scrawly. And it ends up bleeding into the ever larger black edges of the morning paper. And unfortunately for us, Princess Beatrice was very diligent. After Beatrice transcribed her selections, she actually destroyed almost all of the journals. So she deleted far more uh, from them than what remained. As her mother's literary executor, the decision to destroy them was hers alone. Her nephew, George V, was appalled by what she was doing, but was powerless to stop it. The historians have wrung their hands ever since. This has led to some historians calling her one of the most appalling people in history. We get a sense of the sort of thing Beatrice might have been trying to cover up because the Queen herself published some of her diaries in 1868. It was particularly passages of vicious critique or very intimate encounters that she deleted. Things like there was a wonderful little episode where Albert helped Victoria into her stockings before breakfast. But while the remaining diaries reveal intimate moments with her husband, it was the entries about another man that seemed to concern Beatrice the most. Those journals published in Victoria's lifetime described a close friendship with her servant, John Brown. The Queen's Highland Servant, that was his title. John Brown is mentioned 21 times in the diaries, which was far, far more than most of the members of the Queen's immediate family. At the time, it was widely rumored that the two of them were romantically involved. I can tell you it was intense and both sides shared a mutual passion, a mutual devotion to each other. One loose page of her diary, found in John Brown's brother's possession, hints at more. She wrote, often I told him no one loved him more than I did. 
And his retort was, no you than me, no one loves you more. In her own time, Queen Victoria was often referred to satirically as Mrs. Brown. If the whole extent of Victoria's private thoughts became public, it would have been a source of deep embarrassment for the royal family. What the Royal Collection has left is the most unique insight into a monarch's thoughts. Despite her daughter's best attempts, 141 volumes of Queen Victoria's journals still remain. They give a remarkable insight into her incredible life behind palace walls. The royal palaces have always attracted a host of visitors from home and abroad, but there have been some who have regretted crossing the royal threshold. At Windsor, Elizabeth II receives dignitaries from around the world. Elizabeth I hosted guests here too. It's just that not all of them went home in one piece. This is the story of Dr. Lopez. An invitation to Windsor Castle under Elizabeth I might seem like a dream ticket, but you had to be careful because there were spies everywhere. Rodrigo Lopez was a Jewish Portuguese doctor who came to England and rapidly rose to the top of his profession and became the Queen's doctor. And the Queen also very much trusted him. When you're the Queen's doctor, you also treat the Queen's favourites. And Rodrigo Lopez treated the handsome Earl of Essex for shh, venereal disease. No one wanted that to be known. At one dinner party at Windsor Castle, Poor old Rodrigo, he drank a bit too much of Elizabeth's wine and we've all been there, started talking too much and told everyone that the Earl of Essex had venereal disease and mocked his sexual tastes. I'm afraid to say that the Earl of Essex wasn't really the type of guy to say, oh well, you know, what happens in Windsor stays in Windsor. Instead, he was out for vengeance. Two Portuguese agents confessed under a bit of torture, that actually they had been conspiring to kill the Queen and that Lopez had been part of the plot. And that sealed his fate. Dr. Lopez was put on trial at the Guild Hall, and guess who was the judge? Yes, it was the Earl of Essex. He was treated with no dignity at all. He was treated like a traitor. He was hanged, he was drawn, and he was quartered. Poor old Dr. Lopez. One minute you're drinking too much wine at a party at Windsor Castle, next minute you're hanged, drawn and quartered and put on the city walls. Elizabethan England was a pretty bloodthirsty place. <laughs>